we look at the Irish Vigilance Association, created 100 years ago this year to stem the tide of so-called foreign filth in Ireland. This movement, driven by Catholic confraternities and newly formed vigilance committees, initially devoted its attention to British newspapers, but later to literature and cinema. You can get a flavour of the campaign from a report in the Irish Independent on the 12th of October 1911 of an address by Cardinal Logue to the Catholic Truth Society of Ireland. His eminence went on to refer to what he described as the flood of filth in the form of literature which was being poured into this country. Only the previous day he was looking at the advertisements which appear in one of the English Sunday papers, which had a large constituency in England, and he was afraid also in Ireland, and the advertisements published in that paper were a scandal. The greatest danger to the people were not things openly immoral, but concealed insinuations and the pagan and anti-Christian tone which was to be found in their periodicals and in what were called newspapers, but which were intended to draw money from the people to the injury of the innocence of the people. Thank God, up to the present, they had not been completely ruined by the introduction of foul literature, and that was why he said, if the members of their society were zealous in the past, they should be doubly so in the present. That was Cardinal Logue in the Irish Independent in October 1911. Now, these vigilance committees were influenced by the Catholic and nationalist views popular at the time, and in turn, they influenced the development of censorship in Ireland into the 20th century. To discuss the work of these committees, I'm joined by historian William Murphy of Matterday College and by Kevin Rockett, Professor of Film Studies at Trinity College Dublin. You're both very welcome to the History Show. Thanks. William, let's start with what these vigilance committees actually were. I suppose they're... Uh, informal organisations of concerned citizens who are gathered together, organised very often, as you said, by the Catholic clergy in this er early period, to try, in the absence of um, sufficiently strong laws, as far as they were concerned, to enforce censorship, to enforce um, an atmosphere of informal censorship in towns and cities around the country. Uh, and they were targeted at uh, particular... Um, publications. Uh, in the first instance, in 1911, it was the English Sunday newspapers, which uh, was, w were an enormous source of concern uh, for them. Um, and in response to Cardinal Logue, I mean, Limerick was probably the first city which really sort of gathered itself together and organised uh, actively. What is it about Limerick City? Uh, I'm not sure what it is about Limerick City, dear Murda, and I'm loath to comment because I'm from Limerick, so I, I probably won't be allowed home if I uh, make derogatory comments about my home place. Oh, but you're not uh, a city boy. I'm not a city boy, this is true. Um, but, I, well, in the first instance, uh, you know, the Catholic Church was very strongly organised in the city. The confraternity movement was very strong in the city, um, particularly the confraternity of the Holy Family, which was organised by the Redemptorists in that period. Uh, by 1903, 1904, it was allegedly, it's been claimed, it was the biggest lay organisation in Europe. There were six or 7,000 members of the Confraternity of the Holy Family at that stage. And uh, they were very, very actively organised by the Redemptorist Order there uh, around various issues, including very famously in 1904, of course, uh, the Limerick, Limerick pogrom or, you know, a boycott of Jewish businesses was organised yeah. by that confraternity. Um, and Edward O'Dwyer, who was the Bishop of Limerick, also had a long-standing concern about literature, which he regarded as dangerous. Uh, he'd organised the Cat Catholic Literary Institute as far back as the uh, 1870s when he was, he was a priest, before he'd become a bishop. So he was very strong in his pastoral letters in 1909, 1910, talking about the dangers of this evil literature. And when you talk about the dangers of this evil literature, Literature. What was in the content that was deemed to be so objectionable? Um, there were particularly, I suppose, reports of divorce cases was uh, a, a matter of particular concern. These because these contained reports of marital infidelity, which is sort of anti-Catholic activity. Um, crime. They were particularly concerned about crime reports. These. Uh, I suppose, like modern-day tabloids in many ways, uh, the English Sunday newspapers of the early 20th century sort of depended on a sort of diet of, you know, celebrity divorce cases, crime reporting and things like that, and they were regarded as, you know, of, of malign influence. And uh, Kevin, do we know how, how prevalent these publications were? Well, they were very, uh, very prevalent, and of course, uh, um, uh, recently, the recently demised News of the World was one of those in, in very much in the uh, the sites of these that had a probably about a forty thousand circulation at that time, and which had tripled really into the nineteen twenties before it got banned in, in the nineteen twenties. But Logue and indeed O'Dwyer, but also Walsh in Dublin, Archbishop Walsh, had been campaigning at this level really going back into the eighteen nineties, and there's a really interesting insight 
into really what preceded uh, 1911 is there in Louis Collins' History of Easons, which is a fascinating history from the Easons archive and how Charles Eason, the uh, head of the company at that time, was in communication with Logue and others going back into the 1890s and, in, and on at least three occasions in 1899. And 1899 is also the year that uh, the Catholic Truth Society was formed really produce uplifting literature in opposition to this. Uplifting. Uh, yeah, uplifting was the word that they, uh, that that they liked to use. But the other thing is that since we import an awful lot of this, um, that these campaigns from Britain, as would subsequently be the case in terms of, of cinema, was that really in 1909 in Britain there had been a fairly intense uh, concern around these publications. And of course the particular, as William was saying, the particular Irish dimension to it was often around issues that were um, uh, certainly seemed uh, uh, irritating to the Catholic Church, yeah. and 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 even though Eason say was uh, was uh, of course a Protestant, that he actually took it upon himself occasionally to cut out uh, advertisements uh, for contraceptives in uh, in publications that were in distribution, and he was advising uh, the English publishers of many of these magazines and newspapers not to include such uh, advertisements in their newspapers, and some of them chose to do so because the value of Irish circulation. Uh, was considerably more than yeah. what was the was the value really yeah. what they were earning from the ads, and so there was that sort of informal censorship that was going on in the background. And what about the actual tactics of the vigilance committees, William? I mean, what way did they go about their business? Well, I suppose if we take uh, the the Limerick case first of all, and they were copied really uh, quite extensively across the country. And um, they would organise news newspaper boys uh, into guilds, and the newspaper boys would um, you know commit not to sell English newspapers, not to carry English newspapers. They would uh, go around to the news agents in the city they would uh, target them basically they would threaten boycott or various forms of intimidation if they didn't uh, agree to carry the English newspapers um, in Limerick in uh, the 22nd of October which was a Sunday and the, again on the 29th of October uh, 1911 uh, large crowds organised by the local vigilance committee marched to the railway station and uh, essentially um, as attempted to ensure that the papers weren't taken off the train in the first instance and then on the second occasion they actually took the newspapers two lar uh, large packages of newspapers uh, behind a brass band down to the People's Park and burned them in public while making various speeches about you know the dangers of, of these papers. And can it be said that people were pressurised or intimidated into getting involved in this communal action? Um, I think uh, certainly there was some pressure from, uh, you know, up above. I mean, from... One of the contexts to this is, I suppose, uh, the Catholic action movement of this period as well. And you're seeing very much coming right from the top within the uh, Catholic Church um, the popes saying to bishops that they have to organise their clergy to ensure that they are not reading um, not just uh, sort of English Sunday newspapers, but newspapers which are seen to promote ideologies which are in conflict with Catholicism, and then they in turn are pressurising down below to the laity. But, I mean, I wouldn't want to underestimate the extent to which there is some popular enthusiasm, willing popular enthusiasm around this, and part of it is being fed also by a rhetoric of nationalism, yeah. which is, re you know, really strong and really popular. Do your bit for your country. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, mm. the Catholic Bulletin in, in March 1912 sort of praising the people of Limerick uh, said, it is, he said, it is the people of Limerick who long ago fought most fiercely and tenaciously against the foreigners in the time of Cromwell mm. and the time of William of Orange, and great credit is due to their descendants today for being in the vanguard to fight the new foreign foe evil literature. Mm -hmm. So in a sense there is, um, I suppose, there is a popular atmosphere of nationalism and anti-Englishness which, you know, feeds yeah. this as well. Yeah, yeah but you, you also have to recall uh, that um, Lord Aberdeen, the Lord Lieutenant, who had been here for quite a while and was a Catholic, uh, that uh, he was head of the similar organisation in Britain, had been for about 15 years, and was also a head, uh, our president, of a, in a, a similar sort of anti-prostitution organisation. And Logue immediately rode in behind. And really, it, it was, or I should say, Aberdeen was the person really who made it a national movement movement by making public utterances to the effect that this was a great thing and, and, and by Christmas of 1911 it had developed into a national movement with a very powerful um, a Dublin branch that really became quite important uh, later on in terms of film censorship in Dublin. And the Dublin Vigilance Committee, really, which became the catalyst before uh, the Irish Vigilance Association was formed, in uh, really in 1912, and it became the coordinating body. But a lot of that was built around 
uh, other or existing Catholic organizations like mm. the Priest Social Guild, um, the uh, Christian, uh, the Catholic Young Men's Association, and the like. So the so I, I wouldn't really regard it as really some sort of um, popular Catholic Catholic thing from below. I think it was controlled, contained, and maintained by Catholic priests, and we certainly know that right into the 1920s when these campaigns eventually led to both film and, you and seem book to have censorship. A, there seems to be a parallel stream of activity there with the civic authority. The local authorities, Dublin Corporation, for example, gets involved in yeah. film censorship. Well, that's right. Well, you see, a, um, from uh, coinciding with the, um, the the campaign against evil literature, and of course we had a committee of that name in 1926 uh, that was that was established, is also um, becoming what's becoming available is a much more challenging, from a Catholic point of view, challenging type of drama cinema that really begins to be produced from around 1910, 1912. So drama films uh, with uh, crime and uh, extramarital affairs and all of this really become part and parcel really of cinema. The first 15 years or so of film are really largely travelogues and fairly innocuous dramas. But as much as film became longer, leading to feature films within a few years, that the content of films became more and more an irritant. And, uh, and in fact, in Britain, again, taking the lead here, um, that the, the British courts began to interpret the 1909 Cinematograph Act, which was to give local authorities power over safety issues in cinemas, began to interpret that act very quickly as giving local authorities the right to censor uh, the content of films. And again, the, in terms of the content and what was found mm. to be objectionable, what are you talking about in cinema at that stage 100 years well, ago that would have been deemed... Well, initially, um, the, the first two controversies in Dublin uh, concerned, in fact, a boxing film in 1910 fe featuring the African-American boxer Jack Johnston when he won the World Heavyweight title and, and held it for about five years. And there was a massive controversy that Archbishop Walsh objected to the film because... Um, it seems on racist ground. And then in early 1913, another major controversy uh, erupted about the first major Life of Christ, a film called From the Manger to the Cross. Now, what's really interesting about that controversy, which the Irish Times editorialized on three occasions about it, was that all of the Protestant churches right across the spectrum weighed in against the mm -hmm. film to try and have it stopped, even took a court case. But the Catholic Church stayed aloof. And, and this is why it wasn't really until 1915 that the vigilance committees began to take the real focus onto cinema. And over the following, from uh, really August 1915 through the following uh, 12 months, they began to pressurize Dublin Corporation uh, uh, councillors into introducing uh, corporation censorship, which eventually came in September 1916, uh, with many of the major figures in Dublin Corporation um, weighing in behind the Vigilance Association. And that they'd held aloof, I think, uh, in those first years, in part because I think the, they didn't want to be involved in an organization or associated with a campaign that had a Protestant dimension. Mm. And the sectarian nature of what happened in Dublin Corporation is very evident. You just have to read the Irish Catholic to, to see how vicious really they were against yeah. uh, and only four councillors eventually uh, opposed Dublin Corporation censors and when eventually they appointed censors from 1916 through to 22 um, that uh, the uh, Vigilance Association were given the right to appoint censors yeah. in Dublin Corporation. And you, you mentioned limited opposition I suppose. Yes. Yeah. Is there a sense for them of, of a coherent opposition to the vigilance committees or, or their message? Um, not particularly. You do, you do have some opponents. Uh, I mean, uh, I suppose in one sense you have, I've talked about Irish nationalism, mm. and uh, you would have within the Irish Ireland movement figures who would support it, uh, who support the vigilance, but then you would have intellectuals within the Irish Ireland movement who equally would have felt that this is this sort of action is too, is too far, it's, inter it's interfering with intellectual freedom. That would have been expressed quite openly. Also, there would have been some concern among some, for instance, socialist activists who would have, who would have feared that the real target, for instance, was periodicals who are promoting ideas around socialism, etc. And this is really what the bishops are looking to get at. And they would have voiced that concern and att attempted to defend themselves in that regard. But one of the things that's interesting to me about what Kevin is saying about the cinema is that I suppose it's innovation that really, in, in many ways, provokes mm. this response. Mm. I mean, the Sunday newspapers are a new phenomenon in, in Ireland, really, from, it's the 1890s when they're starting mm. to arrive in. And it's this innovation provokes fear among people. And also, uh, around, 
it's an older technology than film, but photography had an impact as well in this period because you're starting to get photographs in the newspapers and also you're getting to start to get postcards, slightly salacious postcards mm -hmm. which are being sold. And th these are also you know, provo provoking fears. Another uh, area where there's some innovation in this period is, is libraries. And I think that's a concern as well for some of the vigilance associations because even though there'd been a Public Libraries Act as early as 1855, very few public libraries mm -hmm. were actually opened in Ireland until the first decade of the 20th mm -hmm. century when Carnegie started to fund yeah. these libraries. Mm -hmm. And control over the stock of these libraries is actually an issue as well. And it's a real concern for some of the campaigners. Yeah, it was a major, I mean, it was a major concern in England as well are the circulating libraries. And even uh, Charles Eason is very interesting on that and saying, well, really, even if it's approved by the circulating libraries, you still have to be wary of, of some of the material. And uh, But one of the, uh, I, 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 I think he is right, certainly Sinn Féin came out in support of the campaign. D.P. Moore, and of course, leader, was very strongly behind it. So the whole nationalist and cultural nationalist rhetoric was very strong behind it. But underpinning it all, there's no doubt there was a very powerful sort of Catholic dimension uh, to it, a Catholic clerical dimension, because the key figure in Limerick, um, in, and based in, in St. Michael's Parish, a, a huge working class parish in Limerick, um, was one of the curates was a man called um, Father uh, Richard Devan. And he was not only a curate there, but also he was the um, chaplain of the garrison in Limerick from 1904 to 1914. And uh, Devan, who became a Jesuit in 1918, in the 1920s and 30s, in fact, right up to his death in 1951, was the key Catholic intellectual who pushed through a whole range of, of, of Catholic policies in terms of censorship on the one hand. He was, a, he was one of the only, I think, two private individuals who were allowed to uh, give evidence to the Committee on Evil Literature in 1926. He was involved in the Dance Halls Act of 35. He was involved in um, uh, legislation about illegitimacy and the like. In, so in, he's in cutting his teeth in, yeah, the, in this environment. Absolutely. And as, as uh, in, in, in the recent book that my wife Emer and myself have published on film uh, exhibition and distribution in Ireland uh, from this period through to the present, that we look at, at Devan's positive film policies. What's quite interesting is that Devan in the 30s took control of, of promoting the establishment of a, an Irish Film Institute uh, supported by the Irish Press, the Irish Times and all of the other uh, key newspapers at the time and indeed even and he was, because he was a friend of De Valera's he even got a government inquiry into the cinema in 38 through 42 but then and he, he favoured a broad based vocationalist type uh, uh, organization but when he came up against the power of Archbishop McQuaid when he came into Dublin in the early 40s the sort of broad based organization that Devan favored was converted into an exclusively Catholic one when what yeah. became the National Film Institute of Ireland was formed in 45 so in that sort of sense we have a, a really a long lineage out of Limerick into a, a, a very um, a continuous um, yeah. policy effect right through the first uh, 30 years of the Free State. And William, are there ways through which we can measure its success or otherwise? If you take something obvious like the circulation of the mm -hmm. newspapers that they found so objectionable, did they decline? Was there a, a, a noted...? Um, it, in the immediate aftermath, or while the campaign is going on in 1911, for a couple of months there is an impact upon the sales of newspapers and it's hard for the, uh, the distributors of the, those English newspapers to get them into towns and cities. Mm -hmm. But after that, no. I mean, I think Kevin mentioned already the News of the World was selling about 40,000 mm -hmm. in 1911, 1912. By, by 1926 or 7, it's selling 130,000. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it, it just simply doesn't work. Um, which, it, if it had worked, it would have been a boon, for instance, for certain Irish publishers of newspapers. Yeah. And I think that's a, an interesting factor as well, in that the campaign is certainly supported by some of the Irish newspapers, like the Irish Independent and the Freemans Journal. There was, in fact, an awareness. In fact, it's interesting on some of Eason's uh, bookstalls in, in, in Limerick in particular, sending back communications back to Charles Eason saying, oh, uh, that this, this campaign has really been surreptitiously been supported by those, and presumably pointing the finger at, at the Freemans Journal and, and elsewhere. And indeed, of course, Eason's in the end found the, the solution uh, uh, to actually supply the garrisons by bypassing, not supplying them through their own bookstalls, but in fact going to the commanding officer and in brown paper packages delivering this, mm. the newspapers that otherwise would have been uh, taken it and seized. It makes you wonder as well, though, are, are these campaigns counterproductive in some ways mm. because they draw such attention 
to mm. the very mm. publications that they want shot of. Mm. And to, to, to look at those circulation figures, it would seem to suggest it was. I think that's undoubtedly true, and I think mm. uh, Kevin mm. has written about this uh, mm. in terms of cinema. I mean, some of those early controversies around films just drew crowds to, to those yeah. films. There's a great one from 1915, just in fact what probably prompted the Vigilance Committee to set up. There's a film called A Modern Magdalene, which tells its own story with a, a famous uh, singer, uh, a, a swimmer called Annette Kellerman, uh, which was uh, famous uh, for its nude scenes and the like. And one of the uh, Dublin Vigilance Association activists um, uh, went into the cinema, in, in fact, the Sanford in, in, in Renola, and uh, threw things at the screen, caused a commotion, and was taken to court. Of course, the result was that when the priest announced it at church the following Sunday, that there were, uh, there were hundreds who were turned away from the cinema. So uh, these campaigns, indeed, uh, down, tend to be down with that sort of covered. stuff. I'm wondering as well, is there a gender element to this? Because when you look at some of the cultural nationalist material of the year and, and, and then linked in with the, the Catholic agenda, the Catholic campaign, they often refer to women as being the first line of defence. You know, was that used as an argument for women to get particularly involved? The mothers of Ireland needed well, to protect. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that language is certainly there. Although the crowds that mm. are turning up, mm. uh, for instance, at the railway stations in Limerick, it's very much noted that there are crowds mm. of men and boys mm. who are doing this. Mm. And I think that's partly because of, you know, they're being organised through confraternities, it's yeah. like male confraternities and things like that. But having said that, I mean, w I mean in some ways, uh, this is looked at from this distance is very conservative movement um, but there are progressives who are involved as well or people who we would now regard as progressives so in some sense there are people who are involved, actually involved in women's suffrage for instance who are very concerned ar around these issues and who um, believe they are protecting you know women's rights in yeah. these contexts uh, for the ex exploitation of women uh, for instance in the sort of pornographic postcards etc that's yeah. been talked about um, so w the female element is certainly there uh, but if, uh, um, I'm not sure that um, it's mainly women who are going out onto the streets or, or mainly members of the organisations. Yeah, you get the sense it's a much broader yeah. canvas, though. Yeah, I think you get the sense that almost all of this is run by men, and even when um, that they, um, the Catholic Church on its own terms manages to put together the interdenominational um, uh, committee in, in, um, in, in, in the 20s after independence, because I would read all of this really as testing the waters as to what was acceptable mm. in terms of um, post-independence. And in fact, when Dublin Corporation um, censorship, film censorship proves to be so, so shambolic, that it's very interesting. There was a, a conference on uh, a film sense on national film censorship that was organised in December of twenty one, January twenty two, and you know those what those dates mean in terms of what was what was coming. The rubbish has been discussed, uh, all right. And in, even the previous year, the Dáil itself had actually passed a resolution um, uh, advocating national film censorship. So there are all these or our agenda setting for what of course became the 1923 Censorship Films Act and from their point of view the uh, equally draconian Censorship Publications Act of 1929. That was really what was in their sights because they knew at a local level they could only ameliorate the problem um, whereas of course once that they had the state apparatus behind them. Though what, in, in fairness the, ma the majority of the cabinet in 1929 were against the draconian uh, uh, publication censorship and it was only put through reluctantly but this groundswell at that point from below was so strong the cabinet itself you know even coming a gale conservative and all as it is yeah. couldn't resist it and William if you were making an overall assessment about the success or failure of the vigilance movement how would you uh, characterise it? I suppose, well, in terms of constructing, uh, a st eventually, the, in terms of constructing the roots of a movement that would successfully construct a, a censorship apparatus later on, they're very successful. But I wonder, in actual fact, how successful they are in terms of their aim, which is to keep ordinary people away from reading this stuff. Uh, I'm not sure that they were very successful at all in that regard. I mean, I think people continued going to the cinema, they continued reading these newspapers, and they continued taking away from them the very messages that the Vigilance Association had hoped they wouldn't take away from them, to be honest. And it makes you think as well about some of the thunderous pronouncements 
from the pulpit in the 1920s, there had to be something to denounce. So people were quite clearly still following their own. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it becomes, uh, is the post, you know, the lentil pastoral denouncements, uh, denoun denunciations in the 20s and 30s really as much to do with trying to find an enemy, uh, and popular culture being the key one. And there was the cinema, of course, there was literature, there was jazz on radio and all that, which was very much in the sights. And, and uh, we couldn't have the, the English to bash anymore. So here was the opportunity to find a, a, another enemy. And of course, but they, but the, the administration after independence was draconian. Yeah. Because in the six years of Dublin Corporation censorship, about 100 films were banned. But in, in the first year of film censorship and continuing on, there was 100 films per year being banned. Uh, and in total, uh, uh, in, in the first 40 years of film censorship, there's about 2,500 films yeah. banned and 10 to, 10, 10 to 12,000 cut. Well, it's fascinating to look at the origins <laughs> of, of what became a very considerable censorship movement. And um, I'm very grateful to you both for coming in. Thanks to Kevin Rocket and to William Murphy. Kevin Rocket's book, Film Exhibition and Distribution in Ireland, 1909 to 2010, is published by Four Course Press.